I think that there is a sort of difference between the Prime Minister, Mario Draghi, and his own majority, which, as you know, is made from uh, different parties. And within the majority, there are still uh, two um, populist parties, like the Lega of Matteo Salvini and the Five Star Movement. And this is one point um, which is sometimes difficult to understand from an Anglo-Saxon view, because you have from one side a, a prime minister who is a strong uh, Europeanist and a strong Atlanticist, and uh, there is no, I, I think, no doubt on this. And uh, I think also that Mario Draghi has been uh, strong enough in the sanctions. Uh, if you look at the European countries, Italy uh, um, made even more than France or Germany in sizing oligarchs assets, yachts, boats, uh, properties, villas, okay. But I think that this is uh, only one part of the situation because uh, I know for sure, according to my sources, that Draghi had to, um, to win over uh, many, many pressures coming, I think, not just from within the majority, but also uh, from uh, the economic Itali Italian establishment, uh, from there is, uh, a, a, and here I come to the first part of your question. Uh, what about Italy, generally speaking, on Russia? Well, you you have in Italy a, a, a public opinion which is profoundly uh, splitted and divided. I would say in two parts. There is a strong pro-Russian party, which is not just the populist in, in politics, but is also, uh, for example, the, pacif the pacifism, the movement uh, which is in the street uh, rallying uh, against the war, which is, of course, a noble reason. But uh, I think it's, um, uh, it's crystal clear to me that it's been exploited from Russian um, uh, propaganda and Russian channels and Russian accounts and Russian coordinated networks on the on the social media, and uh, so um, why we have uh, half, at least half part of the public opinion is so sympathetic with Russia. There is an historical reason. We are the the country of the communist part, the, the larger communist party in Europe, uh, which was profoundly anti-American and anti-NATO. Then we, we, we were the, the country of Silvio Berlusconi, who had a profound personal relationship with Vladimir Putin, not just a personal friendship, but also I, um, I think uh, th there has been a lot of uh, doubts over the nature of his economic relationship with, with Putin, and especially with the resale of gas from gas in, in Italy. Then we have a, a, a prime minister from the center left, Mr. Romano Prodi, who was a, um, very um, uh, realpolitik oriented. He was a sort of an heir of the traditional uh, foreign policy of the Democrazia Cristiana, the Christian Democrats. They pretended to be uh, just pragmatic. We, we, uh, they invented a theory um, according to which Italy was the bridge between the U.S. and Moscow, and uh, and this continued also in the in the in the in in the in the in the two Romano Prodi governments, and but uh, both Silvio Berlusconi and Prodi they didn't they didn't change. Uh, if, if, if even Mr. Berlusconi, if, if I have to say now and to look at the past, um, they didn't switch away from our Europeanism and Atlanticism. What's new in the populist years uh, after 2018 election with uh, an astonishing victory from the from the Five Star Movement and the Lega. What's new is that um, we, with the two governments uh, run from uh, the Prime Minister Conte, the former Prime Minister Conte, there has been some sort of uh, hesitation or shifting 
from our traditional system of alliances. They signed a memorandum with China, the Five Star Movement. Then they, they um, admitted a, a very dodgy uh, Russian COVID aid mission in Italy in 2020. And they made um, uh, the former prime minister, he, he, he gave to Mr. Trump, then president, American president, a sort of gift uh, uh, tolerating that the, the general attorney, William Barr, came in Italy and, and uh, meet with the, the then chiefs of the Italian intelligence. And uh, this is just to say what has been the Five Star Movement here in Italy. Not just a pro-Russian party. The founder of Five Star said, Beppe, the comedian, Beppe Grillo, I, I don't know if you, I think, I, I'm, I'm, I am afraid that you well know the comedian Grillo. And he said, um, he said once in an interview that uh, Putin and, and Trump uh, um, they, they both were uh, two uh, great statesmen uh, and uh, international foreign policy needed both of them. This is literally Beppe Grillo. So this is the Five Star Movement history. And on this, you have to, I don't know that, then there is the economic capture from Russia. And this has basically, in my view, three, three levels. The first one has been the, the mega, uh, uh, the flood of money invested from Russian oligarchs in Italian real estate, especially in Sardinia, in Tuscany, in Umbria. Uh, but this is the more, just the more, uh, the more evident level, because there is a second level which is about the, the resale of the, ga the Russian gas in, in Italy through Italian uh, small companies, and then uh, also sometimes through uh, dodgy companies uh, uh, with, uh, um, with owners abroad, for, exam for example, in Austria or in Cyprus. And then the third, the third level of the Russian, the Russian capture is the relation between uh, especially two great Italian banks, uh, which are uh, Unicredit and Banca Intesa, with Russian capital within. You've seen a very interesting, the sanctions are very interesting. And the sanctions, as you know, have been debated for a long time about whether they do anything. Putin invaded Ukraine, so clearly they were not in return. Mm. But Italy, as the recipient of a lot of Kremlin money, becomes thus a country where a lot of people look at it and ask the question, why aren't they doing more? And you document brilliantly in your books the problem. And it's not just Italy, it's Britain, and elsewhere too. But Italy is always seen as a place that is not doing its share. So, what have we seen in the last month? We have seen sanctions go from deterrence to punishment. Yes, exactly. We have not in the past 20 years really seen this kind of, I won't say disagreement, this kind of tension around Putin. I agree perfectly on the, on the I think that there is some sort of split within the Kremlin uh, between the, uh, the Siloviki, the, the, especially, I suppose, the hardliners within the Siloviki and the oligarchs. And this is a real, real issue. And I think it's demonstrated also from the supposed poisoning of Raman Abramovich in the beginning of March. And, um, and, and, and I think, according to what I know and to a sum of sources we have, that the, the, poisoning, the poisoning has been real. Uh, even, even, if the, even if the Kremlin, even if the Kremlin is denying, even if the United States uh, itself, they told 
it's not sure if it was some sort of environmental factors which uh, provoked the, the symptoms of poisoning. Of course, I suppose that the reason is that the US don't want to put the pressure on these, on Putin himself. What, 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 in any case, I think that also the story of the, the negotiation with uh, Roman Abramovich, uh, it demonstrates that there is a, a strong effectiveness of sanctions, at least on the oligarchs, on the group of oligarchs more related with the UK or Italy, the more the more used to the um, to the to the to the Western and, and not just Western, but especially the European way of life, uh, the, the the large apartments in London or in Rome or in Paris, the holidays in Sardinia. And I think that Abramovich is just an example of what the sanction could have uh, afforded if they uh, were implemented years ago and not just and not just eventually now. But in any case, what, what's interesting is that now there is um, uh, for sure people um, uh, discontent uh, around Putin circle. And uh, I think this is demonstrated also from the, from the firing of some of the chief of the FSB, uh, the chiefs, the two chiefs of the, of the fifth directorate, the foreign directorate, within the, the, secret, uh, the internal secret services. Um, coming back to the sanctions, two of the, na the Kremlin narratives on the sanctions uh, were, first, the sanctions are not useful. They, uh, the sanctions don't work. This is, of course, false. It's and this false. is a Kremlin narrative. This narrative is profoundly uh, sp uh, spreaded across the Italian media, and especially the Italian TV. I certainly think that, and I have some, again, the people I talk to in that circle agree that there is, there is dissatisfaction. Now, whether that results in a move against Putin or a slowdown again in the policy, we do not know. I, I think that you have to look at sanctions, as I said, in two ways. One, they three ways. They are a tool to get the allies united behind pushing back against the Kremlin. What does that mean? That means that you have to go with the lowest common denominator. So you end up with sanctions being less effective than they might otherwise be. Number two is that they have failed in the sense that Putin invaded. He invaded. That means they failed. Because the whole purpose of sanctions is to prevent the invasion. However, and this is, on this, I agree with you a thousand percent. They are having and the idea that Abramovich would be poisoned, maybe, or would disagree with Putin, maybe, or would even be at the peace talks is really a remarkable thing and shows divisions in the leadership that we've not really seen, as you know, for the last, the last 20 years. So sanctions, yes, keep them hard, keep them unified, keep them tough. But they fail because they didn't prevent the war, but they may succeed in pressuring Putin to change course. And that's why the Abramovich uh, story is really very interesting. Possibly, I, I would just say a last, a last uh, view on sanctions uh, as, as seen here from Mihidali. The last one, the last one, sanction weapon, we uh, uh, until now we didn't want to to embrace in Europe as being the, the the total embargo on oil on Russian oil and gas. But I think that but I think that uh, it's it's it, it, it's also possible that we, uh, we will end uh, eventually to this. Uh, for one reason, there is, uh, if you look uh, once more to the narratives, the, the narrative 
uh, on Russian gas here in Italy has been in the last weeks that there was a totally Kremlin narrative. We can do without the Russian gas, without the import of Russian gas. How we, we can heat the bacon the morning without the Russian gas? Uh, what, I, what I'm seeing now is that uh, Draghi uh, has been trying uh, since a uh, few days uh, to change this narrative because he went to the, to the law chamber in Italy and he literally told it will, be, it, it will have a cost, we will pay something, but we are the European Union, so we can, we can find um, alternative producers of gas. And he mentioned especially um, the Algerian, the uh, Azeri, the Qatar, and of course the United States gas. And, and then he also added, there is also one thing we... we we don't think as Europeans that we are no more Italy or France. We are Europeans. And the European Union just last year um, produced a, a huge effort in financing the fight against the, the pandemic, the COVID, the coronavirus. And they uh, just Italy had sort of 250 million only from the European Union because there is an article of the EU treaty which allows the Union to, 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 to make payment and more debt to, for, for the single nations, the single countries. And uh, I think that this is a, an important switch in the narrative because we are trying to explain, especially to the populists, especially to guys like Salvini, uh, that it is possible to do without the gas of Russians. And this is important. And the last point is uh, that if, if, we, if, we, uh, um, if you look also the, the weapon issue, if there is, a, a, there is a, an increasingly consensus about sending more weapons to Ukraine resistance, we started from a sort of quasi-pacifist point of view, uh, according to which the Italians were saying, no, absolutely, we don't want to, we don't want to send hard weapons because weapons mean uh, future wars, weapons means no peace in the in the in the in the future but i think that also this is shifting we draghi said literally and this is important for a country like italy in which catholics are very strong uh, we will we are sending and we will send more weaponry to the ukrainians and uh, uh, last, very, very, very last thing is that if you look, the danger is always the, the, the two populist parties within the majority. Because if you look at uh, Matteo Salvini, uh, he discovered himself as a sort of very weird and unbelievable uh, pacifist and no, no way. He, he, in the recent past, in recent years, he made a lot of pictures of himself embracing guns and pistols. And now he's, he, 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 he sort of went to admire the American NRA. And now he's saying we are against uh, the, the large spreading of weapons. And if you look at the other party, the Five Stars movement, the, the leader of the Five Star, the former Prime Minister Conte, is uh, launching a campaign, a political campaign against the increase of Italian military spending uh, in the next year. As you know, as you know, um, as you know, there is a, a commitment within NATO uh, which has been signed in December 2019. 
even from the then Prime Minister Conte of the Five Star, to increase to just 2% of total European, uh, of total budget of the, of the single countries. And now the five stars are saying, no, we will vote no, absolutely, definitely to the increase of military spending. And which would be if they uh, would do uh, eventually so, this, this could also mean a crisis within the Draghi government. And this, I think, would be the, the last, the final gift to the very friend of Conte, Vladimir Putin.